Sound 2. First certificate listening test. Test 2. Hello. I'm going to give you the instructions for this test. I'll introduce each part of the test and give you time to look at the questions. At the start of each piece, you'll hear this sound. You'll hear each piece twice. Remember, while you're listening, write your answers on the question paper. You'll have time at the end of the test to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. The tape will now be stopped. Please ask any questions now because you must not speak during the test. Now open your question paper and look at part one. You will hear people talking in eight different situations. For questions one to eight, choose the best answer, A, B or C. One. You hear a woman talking about something she saw. Who is the speaker? A. A shop worker. B. A customer. C. A store detective. I've noticed this woman wandering around the shop, and I only thought she was acting strangely. I got a bit suspicious because she kept picking things up and looking at them, and then looking around nervously. But I'm not allowed to move away from my counter, so I called the security officer, and she stopped the woman just after she walked out of the shop. She'd taken three sweaters and six pairs of gloves. I've noticed this woman wandering around the shop, and I only really thought she was acting strangely. I got a bit suspicious because she kept picking things up and looking at them, and then looking around nervously. But I'm not allowed to move away from my counter, so I called the security officer, and she stopped the woman just after she walked out of the shop. She'd taken three sweaters and six pairs of gloves. Two. You hear a teacher talking to her colleagues. What does she want them to do? A. Talk to the school's head. B. Accompany the students. C. Ask parents to help. You know my students have organized this students club. Well, after long meetings, they've decided what they want to do is go on picnics at weekends. Now, we have a big problem. The head says she'll only allow this if someone's in charge of them. I've tried hard to convince her that's not necessary. You know how it is when she's made up her mind about something. She suggested parents should be asked to cooperate, but students are not keen on that idea. In fact, they'd prefer it if one of us came along. I was thinking, if we take it in turns, it wouldn't be too much for anyone. You know my students have organized this students club. Well, after long meetings, they've decided what they want to do is go on picnics at weekends. Now, we have a big problem. The head says she'll only allow this if someone's in charge of them. I've tried hard to convince her that's not necessary. You know how it is when she's made up her mind about something. She suggested parents should be asked to cooperate, but students are not keen on that idea. In fact, they'd prefer it if one of us came along. I was thinking, if we take it in turns, it wouldn't be too much for anyone. Three. You hear a man talking about a new purchase. What has he just bought? A. A van. B. A motorbike. C. A car. Yes, I got it last week. I'm really pleased with it. It's easy to park and doesn't use a lot of petrol. Handy for work, of course, as there's lots of room in the boot for my tools. My wife's pleased, too. She said she got fed up of arriving at restaurants and everybody thinking we'd come to repair something. She says we'll look like everyone else now and have a bit of comfort, too. Yes, I got it last week. I'm really pleased with it. It's easy to park and doesn't use a lot of petrol. Handy for work, of course, as there's lots of room in the boot for my tools. My wife's pleased, too. 
She said she got fed up of arriving at restaurants and everybody thinking we'd come to repair something. She says we'll look like everyone else now and have a bit of comfort too. Four. You hear part of a radio play. Where is the scene taking place? A. A hotel. B. An office. C. A house. Oh, yes! Oh, they do everything. It's gone. Just the formula. That's all they were interested in. I, I don't get it. I told everyone we were going to be home this weekend. Mm, I told someone we were going away. Someone at the office. You, you didn't? Mm. Who? Only June. Only June? Mm. So she's the spy. I thought someone at the office was mixed up in this, but not her. How did they know we'd be here, though? I never told her that. Well, you didn't have to. She knows we often stay here. Oh. All she had to do was phone and ask if we'd booked in. Oh, what fools we've been. Oh, yes. Oh, they do everything. It's gone. Just the formula. That's all they were interested in. I, I don't get it. I told everyone we were going to be home this weekend. Mm, I told someone we were going away. Someone at the office. You didn't? Mm. Who? Only June. Only June? Mm. So she's the spy. I thought someone at the office was mixed up in this, but not her. How did they know we'd be here, though? I never told her that. Well, you didn't have to. She knows we often stay here. Oh. All she had to do was phone and ask if we'd booked in. Oh, what fools we've been. Five. Outside a theater, you overhear two people talking about the play they have just seen. What did the man like about it? A. The acting. B. The story. C. The stage design. So what did you think? Really, not at all bad. She's different from on TV, that actress, isn't she? Hmm, yes. She's not so believable. Yes. Her lack of stage experience was a bit obvious. But this new writer certainly knows how to increase the tension. Oh, I was on the edge of my seat. <laughs> yes, and the atmosphere he created was really powerful, wasn't it? So what did you think? Really, not at all bad. She's different from on TV, that actress, isn't she? Hmm, yes. She's not so believable. Yes. Her lack of stage experience was a bit obvious. But this new writer certainly knows how to increase the tension. Oh, I was on the edge of my seat. <laughs> yes, and the atmosphere he created was really powerful, wasn't it? Six. You hear part of a radio program about the media. What is being reviewed? A. A computer program. B. A new book. C. A video cassette. Mark Bates believes that we are at the beginning of a new information age, and any of you who agree with him could do worse than getting a copy of his latest paperback. Mark simplifies as much of the technical language as possible, and gives a brief but absorbing history of computers and the uses to which they have been put. He supplies a clear and concise picture of the future effects on education, business, and the home that's both scary and exciting. Mark Bates believes that we are at the beginning of a new information age, and any of you who agree with him could do worse than getting a copy of his latest paperback. Mark simplifies as much of the technical language as possible, and gives a brief but absorbing history of computers and the uses to which they have been put. He supplies a clear and concise picture of the future effects on education, business, and the home that's both scary and exciting. Seven. In a college, you hear a man talking to a group. Who is he talking to? A. New students. B. Students in the middle of a course. C. Former students. And it gives me special pleasure today to welcome a number of people whose faces were a familiar sight in the corridors of this building some years ago. You left us to make your way in the world, and I'm anxious to talk to each of you individually later 
to find out how you have all got on. And it gives me special pleasure today to welcome a number of people whose faces were a familiar sight in the corridors of this building some years ago. You left us to make your way in the world, and I'm anxious to talk to each of you individually later to find out how you have all got on. Eight. At the airport, you overhear a conversation. How does the woman feel? A. Tired. B. Ill. C. Nervous. You're not looking too good. Are you sure you're all right? It was a long flight. I'll be fine when I've had a good night's sleep. You look very pale. These long flights are just so very boring, and you just have to sit there in your seat without moving. And I know I like to get as much exercise as possible. I'm sure I'll be back to normal tomorrow. You're not looking too good. Are you sure you're all right? It was a long flight. I'll be fine when I've had a good night's sleep. You look very pale. These long flights are just so very boring, and you just have to sit there in your seat without moving. And I know I like to get as much exercise as possible. I'm sure I'll be back to normal tomorrow. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You'll hear part of a radio program about bags for walkers. For questions 9 to 18, complete the sentences. You now have 45 seconds in which to look at part two. And now for a few tips for those of you who are going to go walking this summer. Let's look first of all at the type of bag that you should take with you. Ron Smith works in a shop that sells camping equipment and he feels he has a bag for every type of walking holiday. Rod, does it really make a difference what type of bag you use? Yes, Jill, it certainly does. Bags come in every shape, colour and size now, so it makes sense to pick one that is right for your needs. A backpack, for example, could quite rapidly ruin an otherwise good walking holiday if it doesn't fit your back. In fact, the fit is critical, but the choice is so large now that it's difficult to know how to make the right one. So, here are a few things to look for. First of all, size. A bag that holds 35 litres and has three outside pockets should be plenty big enough for a day trip. For a four to five day walking tour, I would recommend a bag that holds 70 litres for a man and 50 to 60 litres for a woman. That's along with a tent and a sleeping bag. An upright bag, that's one that closes at the top, is better if you intend to climb a lot of hills. What about the contents? Well, in order to really avoid the inconvenience of broken containers or crushed clothes, I suggest you go for a bag with a solid bottom. The best ones, but these are probably the most expensive, have a leather base that's particularly resistant to wear and tear. A bag that has two compartments inside will allow you to find things more easily and separate out items such as creams that could leak in hot weather. Extra pockets on the outside of the bag are also useful if you want to carry any tools for climbing that are sharp or get dirty when you use them. Then you have to think about carrying your bag. If it's a backpack, a wide cushioned belt will ease the strain on your back and hips and leave you with more energy for your walking activities. Shoulder straps also help lighten the load and these should be easy to adjust. There are many different types of strap on the market that can be adjusted in various different ways. Try several and compare them. It's also a good idea to make sure there's a horizontal bar that goes across your shoulders and stops the straps from falling off. Well, if you choose your bag carefully and think about some of the things I've mentioned, you shouldn't waste your money. Finally, make sure there are plenty of air holes in the padded part of your bag that touches your body. These are essential to allow sweat to escape and to make your walking or climbing holiday a comfortable one. Now you'll hear part two again. And now for a few tips for those of you who are going to go walking this summer. Let's look first of all at the type of bag that you should take with you. Ron Smith works in a shop that sells camping equipment and he feels he has a bag for every type of walking holiday. Rod, 
Does it really make a difference what type of bag you use? Yes, Jill, it certainly does. Bags come in every shape, colour and size now, so it makes sense to pick one that is right for your needs. A backpack, for example, could quite rapidly ruin an otherwise good walking holiday if it doesn't fit your back. In fact, the fit is critical, but the choice is so large now that it's difficult to know how to make the right one. So, here are a few things to look for. First of all, size. A bag that holds 35 litres and has three outside pockets should be plenty big enough for a day trip. For a four to five day walking tour, I would recommend a bag that holds 70 litres for a man and 50 to 60 litres for a woman. That's along with a tent and a sleeping bag. An upright bag, that's one that closes at the top, is better if you intend to climb a lot of hills. What about the contents? Well, in order to really avoid the inconvenience of broken containers or crushed clothes, I suggest you go for a bag with a solid bottom. The best ones, but these are probably the most expensive, have a leather base that's particularly resistant to wear and tear. A bag that has two compartments inside will allow you to find things more easily and separate out items such as creams that could leak in hot weather. Extra pockets on the outside of the bag are also useful if you want to carry any tools for climbing that are sharp or get dirty when you use them. Then you have to think about carrying your bag. If it's a backpack, a wide cushioned belt will ease the strain on your back and hips and leave you with more energy for your walking activities. Shoulder straps also help lighten the load and these should be easy to adjust. There are many different types of strap on the market that can be adjusted in various different ways. Try several and compare them. It's also a good idea to make sure there's a horizontal bar that goes across your shoulders and stops the straps from falling off. Well, if you choose your bag carefully and think about some of the things I've mentioned, you shouldn't waste your money. Finally, make sure there are plenty of air holes in the padded part of your bag that touches your body. These are essential to allow sweat to escape and to make your walking or climbing holiday a comfortable one. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear five journalists giving reasons for their success. For questions 19 to 23, choose from the list A to F the reason each journalist gives. Use the letters only once. There is one extra letter which you do not need to use. You now have 30 seconds in which to look at part three. I'm successful because my articles have a, a, something that readers can immediately recognize as mine. Now, what's important is how I say things. Of course, I do say interesting things and give my readers truthful information, but above all, what my readers like is the fact that what I write has a distinctive voice. You know, they would know I wrote it, even if my name's not there. Well, I've always thought that when you write an article, you must be sure of your facts. Um, I make sure every single one is correct, and I think that's my strong point. If your readers find out that, for example, that something you said happened in 1970, in reality happened in 1980, or worse still, didn't happen at all, they won't trust you again. Producing a beautifully written article on a subject everyone's talking about is a waste of time if you've got the facts wrong. Why I'm a successful journalist? <laughs> I think it has to do with the fact that I always concentrate on the most important event of the day. You know, when there's been a disaster, for example, there's no point in writing about anything else because nobody will be talking about anything else. 
I'll try to say something original about the subject, but the main thing is my readers know that I'll deal with what's on their minds that day, and they like that. I think my readers like my stuff because, well, first of all, I rely on my personal experience a lot. Of course, I try not to include too much detail about myself. That wouldn't be right. You see, the main point is that in this way I can put a great deal of emotion into what I write. If something makes me angry or sad, I say it. And I never have to pretend I care. I really do care. Insincerity is no good. I mean, if you are insincere, readers will know. Well, my columns are packed with information that could help readers who are experiencing difficulties in their daily lives. And I believe this is the secret of my success. There'll be some advice for people who are buying a house for the first time, for example, or for parents who are worrying about whether their daughter will get into university. And I never bore my readers with my feelings about things. No one really wants to hear about your personal ups and downs. Now you'll hear part three again. I think I'm successful because all my articles have a, a, something that readers can immediately recognize as mine. Now what's important is how I say things. Of course, I do say interesting things and give my readers truthful information, but above all, what my readers like is the fact that what I write has a distinctive voice. You know, they would know I wrote it, even if my name's not there. Well, I've always thought that when you write an article, you must be sure of your facts. Um, I make sure every single one is correct, and I think that's my strong point. If your readers find out that, for example, that something you said happened in 1970, in reality happened in 1980, or worse still, didn't happen at all, they won't trust you again. Producing a beautifully written article on a subject everyone's talking about is a waste of time if you've got the facts wrong. Why I'm a successful journalist? <laughs> I think it has to do with the fact that I always concentrate on the most important event of the day. You know, when there's been a disaster, for example, there's no point in writing about anything else because nobody will be talking about anything else. I'll try to say something original about the subject, but the main thing is my readers know that I'll deal with what's on their minds that day, and they like that. I think my readers like my stuff because, well, first of all, I rely on my personal experience a lot. Of course, I try not to include too much detail about myself. That wouldn't be right. You see, the main point is that in this way I can put a great deal of emotion into what I write. If something makes me angry or sad, I say it. And I never have to pretend I care. I really do care. Insincerity is no good. I mean, if you are insincere, readers will know. Well, my columns are packed with information that could help readers who are experiencing difficulties in their daily lives. And I believe this is the secret of my success. There'll be some advice for people who are buying a house for the first time, for example, or for parents who are worrying about whether their daughter will get into university. And I never bore my readers with my feelings about things. No one really wants to hear about your personal ups and downs. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. You will hear an interview with a man who makes models for films and television. For questions 24 to 30, choose the best answer, A, B, or C. You now have one minute in which to look at part four. Madge Ryan makes models. He's worked for television and various other companies for many years. I went to his studio in London to talk to him. Matt, could I ask you to tell listeners a bit about your background and your early career? Sure. Well... It's strange, really, because at first I never thought about model-making as a career. Fairly early on in my life, I worked for a television channel. I really wanted a full-time job there, but the best I could get was holiday relief work, filling in for people while they were away. Mm. I started off in the photograph library, and we had to collect pictures for the news, and it was a good way of getting into the business. So how did the career come about? I think it was an interesting time altogether, really. Um, it was the 60s, and everyone was talking about going to the moon, 
there were comic books about space and models of astronauts. When I was working, we had photographs which were used in television reports on the subject. The scenes fascinated me, and I thought, why not build some three-dimensional kits or models of the views instead of these flat photos that were mostly black and white? Mm. And what happened to them? Something quite incredible, really. I still think back on it with a lot of pride. During one of the space trips to the moon, the camera on the spacecraft burnt out, mm. and we had no pictures back in the television studio to put on the news. So... They used a total of 15 of my models as a substitute, and they were broadcast to everyone at home. Do you think that marked the beginning of a career with television? Yes, because shortly after that, I was asked to go to a meeting with one of the TV heads. It was a time when they were looking for more people, and I think nowadays that type of thing wouldn't happen. You'd need two degrees and about six years' experience. <laughs> but they put me straight onto one of the biggest TV series at the time. What was that? It was called Bright Star, and it was a children's program they produced about a time traveller. You know, the kind of thing. Each week he had a different adventure in the 21st century, <laughs> and each time there would be monsters or strange creatures that he'd have to deal with. And I made most of the models for these. And I was just one of a whole load of people. You'd need makeup artists and scene makers and costume designers. It was incredible. Mm. Um, can you move on to some other programs that you've worked on? Because they haven't all been science fiction, have they? Um, no. In fact, the afternoon children's programs were very demanding, too. I made a regular appearance on these where I might talk about um, how to make your own toys or create your own set for a story or run a competition based on space research. And you were also involved in documentaries at the time, weren't you? Yes. <laughs> um, to be honest, I did so many of them that I've lost count. <laughs> but my favourite was Heart of Darkness, for which I won television prizes. And that was quite funny, because at the time it wasn't possible to get an award for what I did. Um, you know, you could be Best Actor or Best Director, but there was no category for special effects. Well, only in films, not television. Mm. Um, so they put my name forward for a lot of other things, and I actually won seven of them. <laughs> Matt, thank you for a fascinating interview. Now you hear part four again. Matt Ryan makes models. He's worked for television and various other companies for many years. I went to a studio in London to talk to him. Matt, could I ask you to tell listeners a bit about your background and your early career? Sure. Well, it's strange, really, because at first I never thought about model making as a career. Fairly early on in my life, I worked for a television channel. I really wanted a full-time job there, but the best I could get was holiday relief work, filling in for people while they were away. Mm. I started off in the photograph library, and we had to collect pictures for the news, and it was a good way of getting into the business. So how did the career come about? Well, I think it was an interesting time altogether, really. Um, it was the 60s, and everyone was talking about going to the moon. There were comic books about space and models of astronauts. When I was working, we had photographs which were used in television reports on the subject. The scenes fascinated me, and I thought, why not build some three-dimensional kits or models of the views instead of these flat photos that were mostly black and white? Mm. And what happened to them? Something quite incredible, really. I still think back on it with a lot of pride. During one of the space trips to the moon, the camera on the spacecraft burnt out, mm. and we had no pictures back in the television studio to put on the news. So... They used a total of 15 of my models as a substitute, and they were broadcast to everyone at home. Do you think that marked the beginning of a career with television? Yes, because shortly after that, I was asked to go to a meeting with one of the TV heads. It was a time when they were looking for more people, and I think nowadays that type of thing wouldn't happen. You'd need two degrees and about six years' experience. <laughs> but they put me straight onto one of the biggest TV series at the time. What was that? It was called Bright Star, 
and it was a children's program. They produced about a time traveller, you know, the kind of thing. Each week he had a different adventure in the 21st century, <laughs> and each time there would be monsters or strange creatures that he'd have to deal with. And I made most of the models for these. And I was just one of a whole load of people. You'd need makeup artists and scene makers and costume designers. It was incredible. Mm. Um, can you move on to some other programs that you've worked on? Because they haven't all been science fiction, have they? Um, no. In fact, the afternoon children's programs were very demanding too. I made a regular appearance on these where I might talk about um, how to make your own toys or create your own set for a story or run a competition based on space research. And you were also involved in documentaries at the time, weren't you? Yes. <laughs> um, to be honest, I did so many of them that I've lost count. <laughs> but my favourite was Heart of Darkness, for which I won television prizes. And <laughs> that was quite funny, because at the time it wasn't possible to get an award for what I did. Um, you know, you could be Best Actor or Best Director, but there was no category for special effects. Well, only in films, not television. Mm. Um, so they put my name forward for a lot of other things, and I actually won seven of them. <laughs> Matt, thank you for a fascinating interview. That's the end of part four. There may be a pause of five minutes for you to copy your answers onto the separate answer sheet. I'll remind you when there is one minute left so that you're sure to finish in time.